Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Strategy Skills Podcast on Firms Consulting. So we all talk about success. We all want to know who are the greatest thinkers, who are the greatest minds, and how do we deconstruct what they are doing, how they are doing it, and modeling their great successes. But the reality is that most of us at some point are going to face incredible failure. Failure that's so debilitating, failure that's so devastating that we may not want to be able to put ourselves out there in the world again. We may just decide that this is too embarrassing. I can't do anything different. I just need to curl up into a ball and hide from the world. And sometimes we do that. So what I'm going to do is in today's episode, I brought in Sunil Gupta. So Sunil Gupta, I'm not going to give away what he's done. I think you need to listen to the episode. But basically, he's someone who has developed a way. He calls it seven steps. It's, yeah, it's pretty good seven steps on how you take failure and use it as a tool or a catalyst or as a change agent to find a better path. You can call it more successful, more lucrative, more fulfilling than what you had before the failure. It's interesting because he uses his life as a case study. He used the life of his mother, which is very interesting as a case study as well. And in the episode, you'll see we actually dedicate the podcast to his very, very remarkable mother. But I recommend you read this, you know, amongst many things. He serves on the Harvard University faculty. He's done some very interesting things. But I think that this is one of the episodes you need to listen to, even if you're already very successful, even if you think you cannot fail, because at some point when it does happen, it's good to have Sunil's wise words to keep you going through it all. Hey, Sunil, how are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm excellent. Where in the world are you? Which beautiful city? I am. Yeah, I am based right outside of Detroit, and uh, I live in a town called Birmingham. How about yourself? I'm actually in Los Angeles at the moment, but I was watching a documentary about Detroit last night with Anthony Bourdain. Oh, you're kidding me. He was doing a tour of Detroit. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, know, I know that documentary very well. Yeah. It's quite an interesting story about how Detroit has, at one stage, the pillar of American commerce, and then the population goes from something like two and a half million to 600,000 in the space of just four decades. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's, it's, it's gone through, it's gone through quite, a, quite a bit of change and I think quite a bit of rebirth. It, it's, it's, it's my home. And so it's always been fascinating for so many reasons. But I think the, the grittiness and resilience of it has always sort of drawn me back in. There's also the point of capitalism, right? It's never pretty, but it works eventually. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's there's a lot to be said about that. Unless you make yourself useful to the world, the world is just going to wave goodbye and move on. Yep, yep. Well, I've had you know I had a chance to spend quite a bit of time in Bhutan, yeah. and uh, and 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 the system of governance there is different, and and it, it does have me thinking about you know whether we're always focused on the right things. It's a difficult conversation because you know what's happening in Detroit is probably emblematic of important decisions all mayors are making in towns that were important during sort of the pre-industrial age, but trying to make that shift to a digital economy. So Detroit yes. is maybe the most extreme example of that, but I can imagine there are towns across the Great Lakes going through the same issues and towns soon that are built around oil and gas. Yeah, very, very much so. Very much so. And, and, and I love, Michael, tell me a little more about yourself, your background and I used to be a consulting partner. I worked with a variety of firms. I uh -huh. started all the way from business analysts, worked my way up all the way until as a partner. I'm mostly serving emerging markets companies, oil and gas, state-owned enterprises, large banks, and so on, restructuring, uh, mergers, uh, transformations, and so on. Uh, then I moved to a boutique firm, which I ran for about two years. And then I now work with a number of ex-partners from a number of companies. And we run Firms Consulting, which is a way of taking the best thinking in management consulting and bring it to a broader audience of people that are trying to make a big impact in the world. Mm. And we say that our goal is to help our clients solve mankind's toughest problems. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for interesting ideas, new ways of thinking to distill that, unpack the drivers and give our audience a way to use those thoughts. So when we looked at your book, we thought, wow, this is interesting. I haven't read a book like this in a long time. And I actually read the book this morning because I always think it's a good idea to read stuff before a call. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a quick it's it's a quick read, right? It's a quick read, but it's also quite pacey, I think. You know, sometimes a quick read is short in terms of number of pages, but it's very dense to slog through. Uh -huh. But I felt that uh, what you did is quite a good format of having an idea and then finding examples from other people and your experiences to encapsulate it, but also yeah. keeping it at about a page and a page and a half. And I did like the fact that you didn't put a lot of theory into the book, which a lot of authors tend to do to give themselves credibility, but I find that it loses the audience very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to try to make this as um, as story-based and technique-based as possible, you know, and I wanted to have enough theory, enough, enough, of, enough of what we're talking about to kind of give a frame. But then, you know, I, I, I find, at, I'm a pretty avid reader myself, I find I'll get you know, drawn into a topic, yes. but then, but then by the end, I don't know exactly how to put it into practice. Yeah. You know, when I was a partner, I remember working with many CEOs and when you go to the offices, they always have some book they're reading on their desk. And yeah. 1990, early 2000 was the age of finding ways to explain theory to CEOs. And you get these big books that no one reads, but they just put it on the table. <laughs> but what I found is, you know, what's happening, I think, in the last five years, and your book does it pretty well, is these days people don't want the theory. They want to know how to implement something. Hmm. And they're finding it, it's okay to say, you know what, this book is too long to read. I don't have time to understand it. Can someone explain it for me? Mm -hmm. And it makes sense, right? Because we're, we're caught in a world where no one has time to read 300 pages to understand one concept. Yeah. Today, CEOs need to make tough decisions, especially with COVID, the rise of Asia and so on. People almost want someone to tell them, they want almost a functional view of a concept. Yep. As opposed Very to the so. long backstory, which has 38 citations and peer reviews and so on, which is useful for a certain audience. But I think if you're hard pressed to make decisions today, you want to know what works. What's the right way to do it roughly? Because, you know, as you know, you obviously speak to many successful people. There's no absolutely 99% right way to do something. You've got to pick a direction and go towards it. Yeah. And you've got to learn and you've got to adjust and so on. So when I read the book, there were a couple of things that jumped out to me very quickly. And do you mind if we just go through that and talk through it? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. The one that caught me very quickly is the idea of a throwaway concept, a throwaway work. And you use the example of Salman Rushdie, whereby he sits yeah. down to write, not because he's inspired, but because that's his job and he's going to write. And he also knows that maybe you don't give a percentage, but the majority of what he writes is going to throw away. But when he goes back and reviews that over weeks, months, and years, he pulls together nuggets that eventually create what many would call a masterpiece, right? He's obviously a very acclaimed writer. Yeah. But what I found interesting about that is that when I do work and I work with many people in any sphere, that's the way they work. But we're almost trained to think that you should not waste your time because that's the way the world works today, right? You've got to be right. measured on an hourly basis, sometimes daily basis. And people feel almost bad if they produce nothing valuable. <laughs> but it's almost as if the greatest writers and thinkers, and I've, I've heard this from other people in arts and in science and so on, who tell me this. But it seems that in some industries and sectors like Silicon Valley, it's accepted. You're going to be continuously failing until you get it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I met Salman uh, when I was in law school, and yeah. and he was passing through town, and I and I was I was obsessed with his book, still am. I, I it's funny, you know, I think about Backable as a book, and yes. I, I think it's, I think it's a good book, but like it's not a it's you know Salman Rushdie put, puts out masterpieces, and 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 Backable is a book, and and uh, and and I think I think that you know when when uh, when he was passing through, I, I definitely wanted to meet with him yeah. at that time I knew one day I would I would I would I would try to write a book and so I wanted to just kind of get his advice and and just meet him and so I I reached out by email a few times I remember he did not respond to my first three emails responded to my fourth and finally said fine okay I'll I'll, I'll meet with you and and so he he gave me the location of a restaurant he was going to be at and he said if you you know I'll, I'll show up to to my, my dinner meeting a few minutes yes. early and, and we'll and we'll meet. And so I, I do. And and the first question that I ask him, 
I could tell immediately he was he was annoyed by, which was which was how do you get inspired to write? Yeah. And he kind of uh, you know he 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 makes it clear that like hey that's not that's like that that wasn't the best question. But he, he, you know, he really wanted to impress upon me. So I remember he made direct eye contact with me and he said, look, I don't get inspired to write. I, I just write. And every day I show up at my desk just like anybody else. And, you know, I, I, I sit down and I start writing and I write for, you know, about eight hours. And most of what I produce is, is not going to be usable. Uh, but buried in, in each day's pile is, is a little pearl, typically yes. a little pearl that can be used. And what I do as a writer is I string together those pearls into sentences and eventually paragraphs and chapters and then eventually books. And, and that's what I do. And I, I, I think that, you know, that, that, that has always stuck with me because, A, I think it, 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 it in some ways demystifies a little bit of what mm -hmm. we think mm -hmm. is just this sort of, I think, you know, fantastical yes. – almost mystical process where, whereas is really just a lot of it's just grunt work sitting down and just, just doing the work. And I've always sort of loved that and, and appreciated it, especially when I was writing and it felt really cumbersome. I would, I would think back to that story. But the other thing too, is that when I, as, as somebody who's built companies and, and sort of now working with entrepreneurs and working with, you know, people inside companies that are trying to spread new ideas, what I think we tend to do is we tend to hold on to our idea until the point that it has cleared some kind of threshold where we feel like it's ready. And so what, what ends up happening, I think, with most of us is you know, internally we're kicking around an idea mm -hmm. and we're waiting for it to feel right. Yeah. And only when it feels right are we willing to put the effort in to start doing the work of getting it down on paper, make it into something that's shareable. Um, whereas I think if you look at most artists, it's the reverse, yes. which is that in order to meet that threshold, in order to get to that point where we actually feel it's right, we need to see it. We need to put it down on, we need to put it down on paper. We need to, we need to get it designed. We need to actually see, we actually need to see it come to fruition. Now, you know, in the book, I call this throwaway work, but that's, that's not necessarily you know the the exact best descriptor mm -hmm. for it because part part of the part part of that is is that you know typically what ends up happening what I've found now after working with lots and lots of people through their process and just studying how backable people operate typically it isn't all throwaway work yes you know it, it there there's there's at least something about it that tends to sort of feel still right even if ninety percent of it goes away it sort of inspires something else and moves you in another direction. Yes, I mean, that makes sense. I remember speaking to a comic book writer and he was telling me something similar, a very prominent one. I can't remember his name. He's not American. He writes in Japan. They call it manga in Japan. And he was saying that 80% of what he does, he can't use immediately. But over mm -hmm. five years or 10 years, an idea that he put together that was really not well developed, he finds a way to repurpose it. So nothing's ever really lost in the greater scheme of things is that in right. that point in time is maybe not so inspired by it but it serves as the groundwork for something later but you know taking this further it almost cuts against what a lot of people teach which is you must be inspired you must be excited before you do something right and many people want that well, trigger you know they go for these motivational courses and they say i'm only going to work because i'm now inspired and two weeks after the <laughs> conference, when they, you know, all that adrenaline drains away, they can't motivate themselves. They've become addicted to a stimuli. Mm, yeah, I, I, I think that that's, I think that's right. You know, I, I, I think that oftentimes, you know, we, we get inspired, um, but I think that we wait to turn that inspiration into action. Yes. Right. And, 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 I, and I think that that is where I think the, 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 at least for me, I think the misconception was about how backable people operate is, is that they're waiting for, they're waiting for sort of more inspiration uh, or they're waiting for that, that inspiration to meet a certain threshold versus just, I think, you know, in some ways I, I think back to, to, to my mom's story. My, my yeah. mom, my mom is an immigrant. Yes. She was a refugee who, who came to the United States having lived in a you know refugee camp and deciding that she wanted to become an engineer with Ford Motor Company. And 
you know, this is the 1950s. Wait, so are really you telling pretty... me? Are you telling me that story in the book is your mother? Yeah, that's my mom's story. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's an amazing story. I think you should just yeah. tell people about the timeline a little bit because it, it it's more powerful when you know what era this took place in. Yeah, yeah. So you know, my mom, my mom, you know, 1950s. She's in a refugee camp on the yeah. border of Pakistan and India. The no running water, no electricity, but she teaches herself how to read. Yeah. And the first book that she reads from cover to cover is the biography of Henry Ford. And she just decides that she one day is going to become an engineer at Ford Motor Company, which is, you know, I mean, just considering all the elements at the time, you know, considering where she that was, Detroit was still racially segregated in this time. <laughs> Right. There was, there was that so forget many, that, right? right. There was so many. I mean, there was so much, right? But just just even starting with where she was and what what access to resources she had, and the fact that women did not become engineers in her culture, and especially not at that time. And and so you know there was so much working against her. But her parents really got behind the dream. Yeah, they saved every penny they had. She gets on a. They got her on a boat. She gets to the United States. She gets a scholarship to Oklahoma State University, mm-hmm. and she's the only she's the only woman in her graduating class. Wow. She drives to Detroit, Michigan, the day after graduation, finds a way to get inside a room with a hiring manager. The hiring manager looks at her resume and application, and he's like, "Well, wait a second. Are you applying for the job of an engineer?" And she says, "Yeah." And he says, well, I'm sorry, you know, we, we actually we actually don't have any female engineers working here right now. Because see, this was the 19, so now yeah. it's the 1960s. And Ford Motor Company is in its heyday, like yes. doing very, very well. But, and they have thousands and upon thousands of engineers on staff, but not a single one of them is a woman at this point. So, you know, my mom, she, in this moment gets, you know, it's a deflating moment. She gets up, she picks up her purse and her resume and she starts to walk out the door and then almost in this last sort of ditch moment, she turns around and she looks this hiring manager in the eyes and she tells him her story about all the struggle that had to happen in order for her yeah. to get to this country, to get to Detroit, to, to be here with him, how unlikely all of it really was. And then she says to him, look, I mean, if you don't have any female engineers and do yourself a favor, hire me now. You know, things are changing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it was in that moment that this middle manager from suburban Michigan decides to take a chance on a refugee from the other side of the world. And my mom becomes Ford Motor Company's first female engineer. What a story. What is your mom's name? Her name is Demyanti Gupta now. At that time, it was Demyanti Hingarani. So we are going to be dedicating this podcast to your mom and mothers everywhere. I appreciate that. I really do. I mean, it's you know, it's 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 one of those untold stories. Until a couple of years ago, when Time Magazine did a big article on it, and it was really just I think special moment for for her and certainly for the family. But I want to, you know, the question that you asked is is sort of I think about inspiration and yes. action and how they relate together. I always ask my mom the question. I'm like, look, how did you have the courage to do what you you did? And I ask her that question because oftentimes I. I get credit that I don't deserve mm-hmm. for doing the things that I do. You know, like people ask me, like, how'd you, how'd you, you know, get the guts to go? I ran for Congress, yeah. for example, right? And and oh, that must have taken courage and guts. And the answer is maybe a little bit, but but ultimately, like, what did I, what did I really sacrifice? It yes. was it was maybe spending a couple of years in in a safe job yeah. versus knocking on doors, um, but. You know, when I lost, I knew that my my family were, was going to be taken care of. I knew that our essentials were were going to be were going to be there. I can't say the same for for my mom. Had yeah. had that whole plan, had that whole vision failed, I really don't know what you'd have done. And the thing that I ask her is like, how did you have the courage to go do all of that? And she always says the same thing, which is that courage. She says she says you know, action does not follow courage. Courage follows action. You you just start acting, and then courage follows, and then you act some more, and you get a little bit more courage, and it starts to kind of it kind of just starts to snowball. Mm-hmm. And 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 I think the same thing is true when it comes to creativity and action. If we're waiting for if you're waiting for creativity or inspiration to hit a certain threshold before you act, you might be waiting a long time. 
But if on the other hand, you act, you might actually find that creativity follows, inspiration follows, and then you act some more, and and more of it follows, and it begins to snowball. I see that being the case much more than, than, you know, a eureka moment. Yes. You know, something your mom says is very profound. For there to be courage in the first place, there has to be some fear that you're going to fail, right? Mm. Mm. Otherwise, why would you need courage in the first place? You'd just do it. Right. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. And now, you know, if you look at your background, my background, for example, sometimes, I mean, I know you probably feel bad about how difficult things are. I know I feel bad about how difficult things are. But if you look at the challenges we face, given the opportunities we have in the United States, it really is not that difficult when we consider what our parents went through before us. Sure. And the reason I like that story is it really puts things into perspective for us. Yeah. It's not yeah. that hard. We just sometimes make it harder than it needs to be. Yeah. Or we yeah. create this the straw man of something fearful. I mean, what's the worst thing that's going to happen to us? We will get a little bit embarrassed. You know, as you say, leave your ego aside. But we'll be taken care of. You know, as you say, your family will be okay. Uh, there'll be some embarrassment. That's the worst thing that will happen. And yet in our minds, we've created that construct of fear as being something that stops us in our path. Yeah, I, I think that's I think it's so well said, Michael. I mean, I I really think that the the way that I I, I think about it is is that it's 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 a resume risk versus anything yes. else. Oh, I right? like that word, resume risk. Yeah, that's all it is. It's, you can look bad in your resume. It looks bad until, as you did, uh, you turned it into an amazing opportunity, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think the thing that I found amongst when I was studying backable people is that all of them went through. Or at least, at least the vast, vast majority of them went through uh, failures, setbacks, mistakes. I, I think the mentality that eventually every single one of them seemed to adopt is that long-term success comes from short-term embarrassment. Yes, I like that. That's a good way of saying it. The way I look at it is that when you fail or get embarrassed, it's like the universe giving you a timeout, saying, "Hold on a second, yes, Sunil." You got to reassess your life, and since you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it for you, right? <laughs> that's right. I think I, I think that's I think that's totally right. I think that's totally right. Or, or, or like, look, I mean, I it could be the universe saying, "Hey, I want you to learn something faster." You know, like Bill Gates always says that success success is is actually quite a lousy teacher. Yes. And so and so it's the failures that that get us there faster. So sometimes I wonder if the failure is really just uh, the the universe's way of saying, like, well, I just put you on a fast track. Yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes, you know, I work with a lot with people who work at McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, and so on, very successful people who go on to very successful careers, right? And I always tell them that the worst thing you can ever experience in life is just enough success. Mm -hmm. Because when you experience just enough success where your salary is increasing 10, 20% a year, and you're getting promoted roughly every two, three years, you may be failing overall, but you do just enough to think you're going to get a breakout change in your career a few years down the line. I love that. But if you absolutely fail, you are forced to reboot and rethink things. But the problem is not enough people see failure that way. And they almost glorify a 10%, 15% increase in income per year, which is a lot, but you know, for high performance, that's not a lot. And I like the way you frame failure. It's not really failure. If you think about what you have, you find ways to make it work for yourself. I mean, I mean the story you, you said was quite funny, whereby when your photo appeared in the New York Times, you <laughs> use it as a chance to meet people. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that before. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, it's, it's so you know, what ended up happening was that uh, I got asked, you know, I, I'd, I'd gone through a string of failures. I had, you know, canceled projects, bankrupt startups. Um, you know, eventually I ran for Congress and lost. I've had this sort of string of, I think, failures. John Stewart, the comedian, has this quote. He said that by the time my career is done, I want to have failed at a variety of things. Yes. And and I and I feel like I'm 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 sort of identi- I really do identify with that. But I get this call one day from an organizer of a conference called Failcon, mm-hmm. which stands for Failure yeah. Conference. <laughs> And, and, and it's this hum, it's this really humbling experience when somebody calls you and says, Hey, you know, I'm organizing this conference on failure and I would love for you to be the keynote speaker. And so I, you know, I end up doing this and I'm on stage, I'm speaking, looking at the audience, 
What I don't notice is that there is a reporter from the New York Times yeah. scribbling notes. <laughs> and, and so fast forward you know, to me sitting in my apartment in San Francisco, and all of a sudden, there is a full-length there is a full length article on with your photo you, with my photo <laughs> at the top of this article. And I mean, that article, Michael, went viral. I mean, you know, you, you it went so viral that there was a there was a period of months where if you would have just Googled failure. Yeah. My face <laughs> would have been one of your very top search results. So, so, you, so you you failed at everything except search engine optimization. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and, and you know what? It's it. One of my friends kind of you know told me this told me this parable. You know, the Buddha had this had this sort of way of thinking about anything that hurts. He said that every time, anytime something hurts, you go through failure, you go through embarrassment, whatever it is, something hurts. Two arrows are fired. Two arrows are shot. Mm-hmm. One, the first arrow is the, is the one that pierces your skin. Yeah. And there's just nothing you can do about that arrow. But the second arrow is the one where you ascribe meaning to the pain. It's what you do with it. And, and that second arrow is the one that you have some degree of control over. And so the question was, you got this embarrassing moment. What can you do with it? Can you, can, can you somehow turn it into something yes. positive? And the way that I, the way I went about that was I, there were all these people, I was, I was just getting started out in my career really. And, and, or I mean, you know, I, I, or at least in this new part of my career where I was trying to start this new healthcare company and, and I wasn't having any luck getting people to meet with me, even for advice, even for coffee. I had been cold calling folks and not getting a lot of responses. So what I did is I started to use that email as sort of an icebreaker. That yes. that article as an icebreaker. I, I emailed a I emailed a bunch of folks and I said, clearly as you can see from this article, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes. But but would you be willing to grab you know 15 minutes with me on the phone or go grab coffee? And the response rate to that was just insanely high. It was much much higher than I would have thought, ever ever thought. People thought it was, I guess, you know, it, it was humble enough. It was, it, it made people laugh, and you know, it just all of a sudden, I, I, my, my schedule was packed with with these coffees with people who I thought would never have given me the time of day, and uh, and it was really those conversations that ended up really paving the way for this book. I mean, because I started to meet with Oscar-winning filmmakers and celebrity chefs and military leaders, I, founders of iconic companies, and just. It, it really just opened my mind into how you sort of package and present yourself to the world. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, right? Because usually when something like that happens, the first reaction people have is that the universe has collapsed and they need to change their email address and move to Tibet. Because <laughs> they don't want anyone to contact them. But again, yeah. it's all in their head, right? Because they have yeah. created this impression that successful people never fail. And successful people will judge them because successful people never fail. What I've always seen with people is that if we have not been successful and we've not, I think, have the years underneath us, we're very young especially, we tend to construct an image of what we think success looks like. Mm. And if we don't achieve that success, we think we're going to be judged very harshly by the establishment. Mm -hmm. But little do we know that successful people are successful because of luck to a large degree. They fail like... 50,000 times. Yeah. So when they look at you, they don't see you as a failure. They see you as a person starting off on the journey of success. It's such a great point. It's such a great point. I, I, I think that's, that's, that's arguably one of the mistakes that we make mm -hmm. is that we don't use these moments of failure as ways of connecting with each other. Universal timeouts. That's the term we're going to use. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I, I, I love it. And, 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 and it's, it's, you know, it's, I think that, you know, my, at least the way that I, I operated before is anytime I was in the room with a successful person that would try to show them how successful I was yes. and try to prove how successful I was. But I didn't realize what a degree of separation that that can sometimes create. It's not that it's necessarily a bad thing to talk about your accomplishments or talk about sort of what you want to do, but, but, but there, there's also, I think a missed opportunity in here are the things that I, that I, that I've done wrong, right? Here are the things that in these moments where, where all of a sudden you kind of realize that, that you're, 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 you haven't been down the right path. 
those can be the best moments to kind of get guidance from people. And I, I, what I found from those conversations is that framed around failure, uh, it just made, it made, it made the conversations much more honest. Yes. Authentic. I found, I found the relationships that I paved through those conversations were much, were much stronger than, you know, the, the, the sort of classic mentor mentee relationships that I, I'd paid for myself in the consulting world, for example, or it was, again, it was not built around success. It was, sorry, it wasn't built around failure, but it was built around sort of success and ambition only. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think these universal timeouts are just so, they're so important. One of the things that we tend to forget, it happens to everyone, is that people who have achieved a level of success in life, they tend to be able to know what is authentic and what is not authentic. So if yeah. you try to talk in their language, but you're not comfortable in that language, and you don't understand that language, two things are going to happen. One, they're going to know you're not authentic. And two, they're never going to know who you really are because you're not speaking your own language. And yeah. you give a great example of this in your book where you talked about that hip hop star DJ. Yeah. Whereby when he was first playing music, he played the music he liked and understood. So he yeah. could craft his own narrative and story behind it because every piece of music and art has a story behind it. And if you're not authentic, whose story are you using? It's not your own, right? But then you gave mm. an even better example when he started a business and he would bring in PowerPoint slides, but he didn't understand why he was doing it. He probably just saw someone doing it, right? <laughs> but then he switched gears and said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to speak the way I speak, use the language I speak. It's okay if I don't speak like these guys, but they got to know who they're doing business with. That's yeah. more important than the way I look. And I thought that's a brilliant example of that. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it's it, being, being you know, sort of the best version of yourself. And, yes. and I, think, I think that we, I think even at its core, what I, what I found with Backable is that oftentimes we try to sort of um, display sort of the characteristics that we think other people want to see. Yes. But in doing that, sometimes we can dilute who we really are. You know, for example, when I started writing this book, I really assumed that people who were backable were going to have a certain style of communication. Yes. They were going to have, they were going to have certain eye contact and hand yeah. gesture pacing. But I, I, I found that to very much not be the case. You certainly had some people who had more of a Dale Carnegie kind of Toastmaster-esque way about them, yes. but you, you had many, many who were shy and quiet not kind of what you would think of for... Well, think of Elon Musk, right? Elon Musk is a classic example. Like, yeah, the classic guy example. has never went for speaking classes in his life. And he right, shows. Right. And, and, he, and he owns it. He owns it, you know? And, 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 and you, know, Steve, you know, it's interesting, but Steve Jobs is, is another one. It's not quite as clear yeah, because he true. has given some, he's given some amazing presentations. But if you go back and you look at the 2007 iPhone launch, mm -hmm. just as an example, it's not... You, you really... You might be surprised... By, I mean, that was supposed to be one of the best, you know, most influential. It has been the most influential product presentation probably of all time. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, Jobs is not necessarily charismatic on stage. I went through the transcript. He uses the word a uh, over 80 times in that speech. Sounds just like Homer Simpson. Yeah. <laughs> he stares at his feet a lot. It's just, you know, and take another example. Look up the, the number one most popular TED Talk of all time. Yeah. And what you'll find is a, is a talk given by Ken Robinson on education. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant, brilliant talk. It's got over 65 million views, but it's a very unted like presentation. He's got sort of, he's got one hand in his pocket. He's sort of, he has a slouch. He kind of meanders on and off script, but you believe every word that he says. And that's the thing is that, is that it's not charisma mm -hmm. that makes a person convincing. It's conviction. Yes. Backable people take the time to convince themselves first, to believe in it first, and then they let that conviction shine through in whatever style it is that feels most natural to them. You know what's interesting about this, right? When you read your book and you get to the interviews, I thought the interviews were very good at the end, so I'm happy you put them in. Because most people, when they write books, they paraphrase the interviews. Mm -hmm. But it was very fascinating to see what people are saying. And there's one quote, I can't remember who said this, but she said, I think it was a she, it's okay to be adding more value, but it's more important to be different. Mm. And what's interesting about that is that's the core of strategy, right? If you yeah. want to have a sustainable advantage in the market, you have to have a point of differentiation. 
Yeah. But, yeah. but think about what business schools do today, right? I mean, business schools, there's part learning and there's part teaching everyone to look the same, sound the same, and speak the same, right? right. If you look at almost every corporate training program in the world today, and not just corporate training programs, every program that teaches people how to be successful in America today, they teach you to be confident, stand in a certain way, project your voice in a certain way. Mm. But it's almost as if all the really successful people don't fit that mold necessarily. Bill Gates doesn't speak that way. Steve Jobs doesn't speak that way. Elon Musk doesn't speak that way. Yeah. It's just yeah. that type of speaking almost fits into the corporate mold. Management consulting, investment banking, Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. And and I think and I think in the process what ends up happening is we 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 sort of we end up we end up diluting who we who we really are because we're trying to be somebody else or we're trying to fit a template. You brought up the example of the of the DJ turned tech entrepreneur. Yeah. It's actually your example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I love and, and I loved I loved that story of Trevor who who you know who, who who told me that story and sort of let me in on it and it was just it was amazing to see sort of how he experienced that in two different worlds. Um, the other story that stood out in the book along the same lines is that there was a there was a it was a uh, pizza shop owner yeah. and, in New York who was pitching an app idea and and the app was basically you you press a button. And you get you get a pizza delivered to you from an independent place, not a not a Little Caesars, not a Domino's, yes. and uh, and he was you know he he had never worked in tech, and he had certainly never pitched you know venture capitalist type of of folks before. Yeah. And so I ended up arriving at this interview at this at this presentation this pitch early because I, a lot of what I did for the book was just I went in and I kind of became a, a fly on the wall during some of these presentations. And and so I arrived a few minutes early and 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 met him and he was just the nicest, I think most like you know just warm guy like I, I like I very charming you know he he first of all he came from a fourth he was fourth fourth generation pizza shop owner, so fourth like he was generation. showing me photos of his great grandfather's pizza shop back in Italy, and it was just like you know you could just tell that this was something that really lit him on fire right like it was it was part of his dna it was who he was but as the investors started to pile into the meeting room you could just see his demeanor start to shift from you know this warm mm -hmm. charming person to kind of just a different just a different person somebody yes. who i think in a lot of ways he expected they wanted to see he you know he put his powerpoint slides up on the on the wall and we started sort of running through his deck and and it was it was it was pretty dry, to be honest with you. It was just it wasn't it wasn't the energy that I had picked up before. So I, I I did something that I typically did not do during these presentations, which which is I spoke up and I said, "Hey, do you by chance have the app on your phone?" Mm -hmm. And he said, "Yeah, I do." Um, so we all got up out of our seats and we 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 basically huddled around him while he showed us this app on his phone. He started to show us these features and. And you could just tell the life and the energy just flooded back into him as he was as he was showing us this stuff. Because now we weren't in this like format of of yes. classic presentation. We were more kind of in huddle mode. We weren't in presentation mode. We were in huddle mode where where now we were looking at something together. And and you know, it really struck me in in in, in a couple of senses. Like the one, first of all, just generally, extrovert or introvert. We naturally, I think, are better when we're showing something than than when we're simply describing what it is. But the second thing is that, like, you know, especially when you are different than the people sitting across the table from you, when 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 they might expect you to be a certain way that you're actually not. I think having visuals or showing something that they you can you can look at together ends up, I think, sort of, I think removing that separation in a, in a much better way than, than saying, all right, well, if they want PowerPoint slides, I'm going to show them PowerPoint slides. Yeah, I mean, what you did is very, very smart here because uh, in psychology terms, when that person was up in front of the audience and they started trickling into the room, you something got triggered in him. And he goes through a set of routine actions when he's triggered, afraid or anxious. By forcing a huddle, you were able to break that routine. Yeah, And he was able to get into a state whereby he was comfortable speaking about what he wanted to speak about. Yeah, and That's a very good technique because oftentimes people are very good, but nobody knows how to break those routines that go through in their head. Mm. You know, coming back to some of the stuff you were writing about, 
one of the things that stood out for me is, you know, when you meet people, typically today, because everyone sees meetings as transactional only, the level of effort they put in is minimal. Mm. And you talk about going beyond Google, you know, coming up with some way to connect with someone. Mm -hmm. I remember many years ago, when I'd moved to a new office and we were competing against Bain for work. And Bain had a strong operations practice in that office. We couldn't think of a single way to get that CEO to pay attention to us. Mm. And that was the CEO of the largest logistics company in that country. They own ports, railways, and so on. And we thought that they had logistics problems. And one of the things we decided to do was a consultant had just bought a car and it arrived at the Arbor. So we said, what if we put a tracker on this car to track the amount of delays that took place from the port to the railway lines to the time it arrived in the showroom, right? Mm. And we took the tracker data to see the CEO. Mm. I mean, that's exactly what you say by going beyond Google, right? Don't go with what people say. Sometimes it's just minimal effort to show people something they've never seen before, but more importantly, to show that you care about them, right? Yeah, yeah. It's such, I love that story. I, I, was, I was in the waiting room of a guy named Brian Grazier, who, yeah. is a, who, is a, who is a Hollywood filmmaker, but he also invests in companies and he runs large teams. And so as I was waiting in this waiting room, there were people there to pitch him on everything, film and television ideas, companies, apply for jobs. And you could just tell that the, the anxiety in the room was, yes. was pretty high. And so when I went back to see him, I said, Brian, you got a, you got a room full of nervous people out there. If I could go out there and give them sort of one piece of advice on how to pitch you really well, what, what would it be? And he said, give me something that I can't easily find on Google. Give me something that's not easily Googleable. Mm -hmm. And I love that because it continued to be a pattern over and over again as I spoke to backers, decision makers, that great presentations and great pitches, great interviews tend to be based on an insight that you have gone out and you have found yourself. You know, you've put in some additional level of effort that went from going beyond Google, it went through talking to specific types mm -hmm. of customers, maybe hard to reach customers, test driving maybe not only the product, but the competitors' products, or doing something like what you just talked about, Michael, like putting a tracker on a car and, and, and walking in with a piece of information that shows A, an insight, and B, I think your level of dedication. In the book, we call that combination an earned secret. Right. Yes, and I like this example because it's so easy to search on Google. People don't make that extra effort. And you know, if everything the book talks about, for me, this is the one that stood out the most because it's so easy to have such a big impact so quickly. Yeah, yeah, and uh, absolutely. I mean, and sometimes, you know, the, the the level of effort that you put in, it doesn't necessarily have to be all that much. It's like, actually I don't know quite what, what minor, it, right? I mean, it, it can it can be very minor. I mean, I was I was talking to somebody the other day who was applying for a job yeah. at a social media company. She's a mother, and she's returning back to the workforce. Now, the trick of it is that her the company she was applying for, she didn't use the product. It's a Gen Z sort of focused product, yeah. but she really but she really wanted the role. Was, I mean, she she felt experienced experienced and qualified, and so she did something very clever. Um, she, t she interviewed every single one of her daughter's friends. Yeah. But then when she interviewed them, you know, she had them send her screenshots of their experience. So moments that they, that they really liked moments that they wish were different. And what she did is she collated all these screenshots on her phone. And so then she does this interview. It's over zoom in during COVID times. And, and she, and she, she brings this gallery of screenshots with her and she walks this this hiring manager through some of these some of these things that she's collected some of these you know things that she found surprising this hiring manager is is so blown away that not only does she get the job but right in the middle of the interview he patches in one of their UX designers yeah. to take a look at a couple of the things that she's found and, and again like we're not talking about a, an inordinate amount of effort here she, she probably spent her no money friend. right i mean it cost her nothing no money she didn't spend any money you know, she, she put her time in, she probably would have put, you know, a similar level of time, just like, you know, doing Google searches and reading articles. And she did that as well. But, but, but the point is that she did something that, that most people don't do. She kind of just thought to herself, like, what would most people do in this situation? She went one step beyond that, walked in with, walked in with an insight and got the job. And, and I've seen, I've seen that happen over and over again. When I was applying, when I was actually, 
trying to trying to get investment for my company, you know, one of the things that I was embarrassed about was how I had found my first customers. Yeah. The, the company, what we did is we did one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching right mm -hmm. over your mobile phone. So people are trying to lose weight or reduce their A1C levels. We would coach them into better health. And you know, to find my first customers, I would stand outside of Weight Watchers meetings. Yeah. And as as people were walking into the meeting, I would I would I would say, hey, do you have a do you have a minute here? Yeah. I want to show you I want to show you this prototype. And most people would say no, but every once in a while, somebody would say yes, and and that's how we ended up signing up our first customers. Now, I did not want to share that story with investors because, especially Silicon Valley investors, it felt like that method was just way too unsophisticated, and I thought that it would it would it would ding me. But for, that shows resilience, right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing is that eventually one of them asked head on, like, well, how did you find these customers? And I was like, well, to be honest, this is what I did. And, and that turned out to be one of the parts of the pitch that investors loved. Because now they you're speaking your language. Yeah, I was speaking my language. I was speaking the, you know, it was, it was showed who I was, but it also was just like, you know, I, I, I think oftentimes because you made a great point, it's so easy to be on Google mm -hmm. that, that we've kind of got accustomed to all this information at our fingertips that sometimes we've lost, I think, this, 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 the, the, the earning of the insight because it's the insight that matters, but it's also the earning of the insight. Yes. How, we, how we arrive on an idea can be sometimes just as important as the idea itself. That's a very good point. And, you know, one of the things I'm seeing through all of the stories here in the way you explain it, because you bring a lot of life to it when you explain it, is that if you look at how we, when I say we, generally the world approaches things, when you go into to ask anyone for anything, whether it's an interview, we tend to talk about why this is good for us. <laughs> why hiring me will help me with my career, you know, I've heard so many people say, I want to work for you because it's a learning experience. But all of your stories here show us that if you want something from someone, you got to show them why working with you is valuable for them. Yeah. And yeah. that's what your stories all show. This lady who took the screenshots, many of your examples earned insight. It's not about asking for a job because you don't have a job. It's about asking for a job because by hiring me, I can bring you this value. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's such a good point. You know, one of my favorite sort of metaphors, uh, you know, for, for all of this is based on a real story in the 1940s, Betty Crocker introduced instant cake mix. Yes. To the yes. That's a good story. Tell the audience that story. That's a brilliant yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're so excited about these instant cake mixes because all you have to do is pour water into yeah. the mix, pop it in the oven and, you know, voila, you get this like really tasty treat. And so Betty Crocker is, is just, they're stunned when they find out that these instant cake mixes are not selling and they're trying to figure out why. And so they hire this psychologist named Ernest Dykta to go out into the field and start interviewing, mm -hmm. you know, the, these, these, these homes and, and just to understand like what's going on here. And when he comes back with this was, was really fascinating. What he said is, I think that you've made the process of making a cake too easy, too simple. Because you, you, you basically remove the customer from the creative process so much so that when a cake actually comes out of the oven, they actually don't feel any degree of ownership over this cake. Mm -hmm. And so Dykta recommends is why don't you remove one ingredient, just one, yeah. and see what happens. And so they do. They, they remove the egg. And so now as a customer, you have to crack and mix in your own fresh egg into the mix and sales take off. Sales absolutely skyrocket. And, you know, researchers have, have, have sort of replicated and unpacked this over and over again. You know, th there was a group of, group of uh, a few folks at uh, Harvard that called this the IKEA effect, which basically says that, you know, we value something that we build up to five times more mm -hmm. than something that we simply buy off the shelf. And so there, you know, there are a lot of people out there with poorly made futons and furniture that they're, they're never going to get rid of because, because they built it themselves. Yes. And, and so, you know, what does this have anything to do with creativity and innovation? And, and, you know, back to your, your point, which is that like, we kind of assume that, or we've been told, I think that creativity is a two-step formula. You come up with a great idea and then you execute on it really well. Yes. But there, there is this hidden step in between 
And the hidden step is where we bring you know, early employees, early colleagues, mm -hmm. early partners, early clients into the mix where they get to crack in their own egg. They get to be part yes. of the building process. In, in the book, we call this flipping outsiders into insiders so that by the time you reach the execution phase, you reach there together. And I believe that you can trace every successful organization, every successful company political movement back to that that hidden step. Getting back to your question, Michael, about like, you know, the story that we tell inside the room and how this is all related is that I think oftentimes what we want to do inside the room is we want to tell the story of me, yes. the story of my resume, the story of my idea, the story of my vision. But what we need to be doing is we need to be telling the story of us. Mm -hmm which is how your story and, and my story come together to create this, create this larger story. Yeah, it's a very good point, Julius. It's maybe one of the most important points because you know, in a consulting world, we use the term buy-in and maybe you've heard about it. But the concept goes like this. If we go to a CEO and we have the answer and we tell him the answer, he's going to be unlikely to implement it unless he arrives at the answer by himself. <laughs> right. Because then he feels it's his answer and he's running with it and no one told him to do it in the first place. Right. And when we run executive workshops, and I've run many of them, we will know what we want the executive to do. But we'll, we'll never tell the executives what to do, but we'll lay all the pieces out, all the analysis, but they must see the insight for themselves because it's their insight. They've contributed, they've built it, yeah. and therefore they own it. And it's a recurring theme in business. Now it's a recurring theme. It's almost a universal thing, right? Yeah. People want to be part of a success as opposed to simply benefit from a success. Such a good point. You know, it's funny. I was talking to somebody the other day about sort of, you know, Jeff Bezos and sort of his narrative process, you yeah. know, where he did not using slides, yes. but he uses narratives. And, you know, I was trying to get inside of like, what, what would a successful narrative look like? Yeah. And it was, it was really interesting because one of the, one of the people who was, who was presumably very, very good at writing these narratives said that what you want to basically do is you want to write out a, a very thorough narrative that has everything baked in every detail. And then you want to remove about every third paragraph from the narrative just literally remove it before Why is that? to bezos because you want him to connect the dots himself ah uh, same thing right the same thing By and it, he needs to, he was, needs to make the conclusion exactly if it was the bulletproof narrative if it was here's exactly what the problem is here's exactly what the solution is for these exact reasons as it turns out those narratives never did well with bezos but it was the, it was the ones that that laid out i think the the problem but but sort of walked him through the solution and didn't connect every single dot that ended up luring him in. It captured his attention, and oftentimes it would arrive on the on the, on the solution that you that you wanted to lay out. This is interesting, right? Because think how much of us are trained to be. We are trained to assume if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're the best guy in the room, and your career is <laughs> going to take off. Right. But if you're the smartest guy in the room and have all the answers. People think you're a know-it-all and nobody wants to be associated with you. Yeah. But if you put forward 60% of the idea and let the team feel as if they took it past the finish line, it becomes the team's idea. Nobody, nobody gives you 100% of the credit, but you get 20% of a much bigger success. I think that's right. I think that's right. You know, people, people feel like they're, they're insiders with you. Right. And, 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 and that's, and that's a really special, I think it's a really special and also a very human feeling. I think it, it transcends sort of work, you know, like uh, the, the, the head of the MacArthur foundation, which awards the genius grant, yeah. I studied, I studied sort of how they, how they go about giving this grant. Cause yeah. it's a very prestigious $650,000 grant. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very selective. And one of the things he told me that was surprising is that if you are already on a, on a clear, clear path to achieving what it is that you want to achieve, yes, then that might actually make you a less likely candidate for the grant. That might actually make you a weaker candidate, for the grant, not stronger. Because, and, and, and his reasoning is we don't want to make inevitable success just feel more inevitable. We're, mm. we're looking to have an impact. 
we, we want to know that 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 people who sort of are headed in a certain path, it can be it can be a positive path. But we want to know that we, we make a little bit of a difference. We can be part of that story and maybe make it a little bit more likely even that they're going to hit their success. And and he was saying that to me from the perspective of the MacArthur Foundation, you know, which, if, for example, they gave the genius grant to Lynn Manuel Miranda, the creator of Hamilton. Yeah. But but he was saying it from the point of view of like this isn't just the MacArthur Foundation. This is human beings. Yes. Like as human beings, we want to know that we 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 made a difference. We want to know that we were part of a story. We were, we were part of the narrative. And and if you can give somebody the if you can walk into a room and say, look. I've got most of the ingredients here, but but I but you know one or two are missing, and it turns out to be that the one or two that are missing are the ones you have. That 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 is an that is an intoxicating experience for people, and it makes them feel like insiders. Yeah, and it's interesting because you know you talk about this being one of the most basic human needs. It's positive and negative. I was watching a piece on CNN with the reporter. I think her name is Lisa Ling, and yeah. she goes out and looks at great human interest stories that encapsulate the fabric of American society. And she interviewed these women, young girls, who had uh, gotten into the sex industry. Mm. And they asked these women, you know, why did you work with this pump? I mean, what is your reason? He abuses you, he takes your money, he makes you work for him, why? And they all said, I love the guy. But when she dug deeper, it's not that they love the guy, it's because they felt with this person, they were building something together. He made them believe that they were working as a team. Mm -hmm. It's the same principle, right? Just used in an abusive way. Wow. You know, in our world, elite consulting firms, Silicon Valley, private equity, and so on, we talk about numbers, right? But the story is far more important than the number and the sense of togetherness. Whether it's abused or whether it's sincere, it doesn't matter. The numbers is almost an accessory to the story you're going to craft. I think that's true. You know, you know, we, we, one of the things that I, I I learned from writing the book about the story is that is that you know it's stories that end up pulling us in. It's the substance that that keeps us there. Yes. You know, and, and oftentimes we either leave out the story or you do what I did, which is in the beginning of of pitching my company, I would yeah. I would I would save the story to the very very end. I, I still remember I was pitching Tim Ferriss on on my company. You know, yeah. he, at that time he had just written the Four Hour Body, yes, and yes. He, and he was investing in technology companies. So I thought he was a perfect investor. As it turns out, he ended up passing. But he gave me a piece of advice that I'll, I'll never forget, which is that when I pitched him, I talked about all the numbers. I talked about the mm -hmm. market and the rising rates of obesity and diabetes. And then at the very end of the pitch, I told my father's story. And my father, when he was in his when he was in his early forties, yeah. he had a triple bypass surgery. Wow! So yeah, emergency, yeah, emergency triple bypass surgery. We we nearly lost him, and, and I, I was about nine years old. And I remember, you know, we went to the hospital to to go get him, and and it seemed like he had aged twenty years overnight. And I remember, I remember on the car ride home, I was sitting in the back seat and I was sifting through the paperwork that they had given us. Yeah. And one of the pieces of paper was basically how to eat. It yeah. was a set of guidelines. And it had things like eat broccoli, eat Brussels sprouts. Yeah. You know, but we we were an Indian family. Like we didn't we didn't eat broccoli. We didn't really eat Brussels sprouts. That, was, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't part of our diet, you know? <laughs> and and there was nothing on that sheet about, you know, chicken tikka masala. Yeah. And and so and so um lucky for us that insurance helped pay for some help from a, from a nutritionist yes. who was able to really help us customize something that worked for us, something that not only worked, but something that stuck. And, and I believe that, that, that a big part of the reason my dad is alive today is because of the weeks we spent with that person mm -hmm. getting that coaching. And, and, and so I share this story with Tim and he, he's, he looks at me and he's like, why are you saving that story to the very end of the pitch? You should bring that story up to the very front of the pitch. Because again, what draws us in is our stories. What yeah. keeps us there is substance. Both are important. But but you know what what I what I started to do is I started to t tell my father's story, and and then I would and then I would back into the idea that like look there are millions of people out there that are living their version of this story right now, 
right? Their own, their own yes. specific version of the story. And, and, and then I got into the market size and then I got into, you know, how, you know, how, how lucrative this opportunity could be. And, and, and that just ended up being so, so much more compelling. Yeah. And the interesting thing about this is that when you tell your story, I can see it's sincere because of the way you tell it, right? You know, when people speak, if they're sincere, they're emotional when the story says they should be emotional, right? Yeah. But if someone rehearses it, they're emotional at all the wrong parts. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but what's happened is that because people know you have to tell these stories, there's almost an entire cottage industry built around this. Yes. Where I people now tell stories that make no sense just because they have to tell a story. Yeah, I think that's I think I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. And I, and I think that it's also you know I tell I tell my students that telling a story isn't isn't about like getting up in front of a room and saying like once upon a time there was yeah, you know no. this <laughs> it's it, it, it's it's really like somebody who I, I I wish I could remember who this was because this this has always sort of stuck with me. But it was somebody somebody once once told me that a good story helps you see the character, but a great story will help you see yourself mm. in that character. That's a very and, good way. And, 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 and so what that means is that you, you are, you are, what a story really is, is, is really, is really one person. You're talking about one person yes. and you're helping, you're helping your audience understand who this person is and, and effectively how to see the world through this person's eyes. So it's not a high level sort of analysis or, you know, th this is what's happening these days to people who are experiencing this. It's let me, let me walk you through this one person's story, right? And then, and then, you know, and, and, and again, it's getting into the details. If you can't get into the details, then you're not going to be able to capture sort of that. You're not going to be able to form that empathy bridge to this person. But if you, but if you get into the details and you, you take a few minutes, take a few minutes with that, then I think you can zoom in, you zoom out to the market size and everything else. And I, and I think it ends up, ends up becoming, you know, authentic. I was talking to a podcaster who says that, you know, he feels very inauthentic sometimes mm -hmm. because he's trying to talk to an audience. He's trying to talk to, he's trying to talk to an audience as if they're one person. But the fact yes. is in his mind, he knows he's blasting this message out to, you know, thousands, if not, if not potentially millions of people. And, and so one of the things he does is he keeps a photo of one of his listeners on the, on, in front of him That's at a all good times, idea. right? Just, just, always just talking to that one person and just pretending like it's a one-on-one -on -one sort of thing, right? Like I'm doing this show for this person. By the way, that's exactly what Tim Ferriss, when he, when he gave me the advice, that's exactly what he said. He said that his book, The 4-Hour Workweek, was turned down by 25 publishers in a row. Yeah. Every, everybody said no. And his friend gave him a piece of advice of like, I think you're trying to write this book for a mass market. What if you rewrote it for just one friend? Like literally pick one friend who you think could benefit from some of this advice and 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 act as if you're writing a string of emails mm -hmm. to him. And so that's what he did. He literally sat back down, rewrote the book as if he was writing to one friend and publishers ate it up. And it obviously becomes this mega huge bestseller. But I think there's another insight here, right? You actually should be talking to one person but that also means you must be willing to alienate people you don't want to talk to. Yeah, I think that's right. You've got to pick your audience and stick to your audience. Because a lot of times the reason why people don't want to talk to one person, not because they don't know that, but because they're just so afraid to abandon an audience. They felt, I spent five years serving this audience. Why would I give them up? Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. I think it's true when you're marketing a product. I think it's true when you're marketing yourself true. as well. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you don't, you don't need everybody to like you. Yes. You just need a few people to, to love you. And if you've ever seen social media, nobody's going to love you in totality. <laughs> right. So you might as well not even try to go down that route. <laughs> sure. That's, that, that, that's, I, think that, I think there's a lot of truth to that. But all the examples we were talking about before, like, you know, with, 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 the, with Trevor McFedris, the DJ, yeah. you know, it, it's, about, it's about understanding that, like, your style may not fit everybody. And that's okay. That, that really is okay. You know, it, it's... It's it's being able to say that that my my audience is out there. I need to go through some of these experiences in order to figure out who they are. But I think where we get into trouble is where we say, all right, we need to make it so that we sort of almost hone ourselves. I, I think there can be a flip side, a, a dangerous side to trying to sort of customize too much 
yes. to an audience. Um, I think you think you can slip very very easily into the territory of wanting to make everybody like you. Yeah, and the problem with trying to customize too much if it's not authentic is that you cannot sustain it indefinitely. Yeah, that's right. Your true self is going to want to come out. You know, you I live in LA. There's a lot of actors and actresses here, and you speak to many of them, and they'll tell you. You ask them, you know, why did you change the types of roles you were taking? And they'll say, well, it wasn't me. I just couldn't sustain being this person I was not. Mm. Mm. And yeah, they're getting paid millions of dollars to do it. If they can't do it for a million dollars, you know, the rest of the world is going to struggle as well. Now, for the end, I wanted to keep one of the best stories you had. Uh, and it's one I actually did not know about until you put it out there. And that's the story of Barack Obama mm -hmm. and how he learned to speak in an uplifting way. Mm. Because, you know, when you hear him speak, he's obviously a very gifted speaker. But he wasn't always a gifted speaker. And that's the point. Yeah. And yeah. it took him, you know, a drubbing in the Congress. Did he lose the, the, the congressional seat? Almost yeah. went bankrupt. Yeah. And yeah. he took his friend, one of the reverends, I think it was, encouraging to speak to one of the caucuses. And that's yeah. where he owned the style. Now, I like this story because it shows you that a skill can be learned. And sometimes failure gives you an opportunity to learn that skill. Yep. I think you got to yeah. tell the audience the story. It's an I, amazing I, I, story. I, yeah, I love, I love, I love this story because you know, oftentimes we look at people who we see as gifted inside a room or gifted on stage, yeah. and we assume that they were always that way. And I, I love this theme of our discussion, Michael, because I think we keep coming back to it, which is that if you rewind the tape, I think in the vast majority of the times you'll find a very different version of that person. Yes. And, you know, in 2004, I was one of my first jobs was I was working in politics and I worked uh, for the Democratic National Committee. And in 2004, the, the convention that year was in Boston and I was working backstage. And when you're working backstage at, at, a, at the Democratic National Convention, what, what you find is typically all the same sort of folks. You know, it was the Clintons. It was the it was the Gores. Yeah. You know, that time was the Lieberman. The royalty of the Democrats. Exactly. Exactly. But there was one person that that none of us seemed to know who he was. I mean, and, and, and that was Barack Obama, because he, at that point, he was a state senator from Illinois. He wasn't really he wasn't a national figure. He wasn't he, a gifted speaker. We should also say that as well. Yeah, well, you know, so he, he gets up and gives that speech that night. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people are, would argue that that single speech changed the course of, I think, American politics. Um, you know, it was an eight minute speech, which is remarkable. And, and you know, while I think everybody sort of had the vantage point of, of watching him, yes. whether that be live or watching... What, I had this I had this really sort of you know unique perspective where I was watching behind him. I was looking out and I was watching the world watch him. And I saw this this tidal wave of energy just rip through the crowd. Uh, and it was it was it, it's a moment that I will never forget. I sometimes will 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 feel it even yeah. now. We're talking about we're talking about nearly seventeen years later. And um, you know, I became probably one of one of millions of people that night that became really, really interested in Barack Obama and his story. Mm -hmm. And so I started to dig in. I started to understand like where, you know, what where did he come from and what, what were the roots? And what I what I learned sort of surprised me, which was which was that four years earlier, he had run for Congress and he had lost. And he had lost big. He lost by a two to one margin. But but the thing that was most surprising to me was how he was received during yes. that campaign. It was, it was, you know, he was described by many as professorial and, and, and stilted. There was a reporter named Ted McClelland who covered the, the, the Obama campaign and, you know, during, during that congressional, uh, congressional uh, election. And, and he said that, he said that Barack Obama is so dry that he sucks the air out of the room. Just want to make this clear for the audience, right? Because it's a very important story. What we're saying is Barack Obama wasn't always a great gifted orator. Yeah. There was a time when he was getting negative feedback on the way he spoke. I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine that today when you hear the man speak. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, whatever your thoughts are on him, like, I mean, he, he, he's, he's, a, he's a gifted, he's a gifted speaker. He inspires audiences and he wasn't always that way. And, and I mean, in fact, what's amazing about the story is that how, 
you know, we're not talking about like when he was a boy, he was shy. Yeah. We're saying no, this is a man stuff. who this is was getting bad is... reviews from the press, the liberal press. Exactly. Four years earlier, four years. You know, we're not talking about a large amount of time here, just four years. And he was being described as boring. And then four years later, in 2004... He makes people he cry with emotion. Bastion of hope and energy and inspiration. Millions of people, you know, d dropping out of, of, of their current careers to go into politics because they want to they they be part of this or they, they want to be part of a campaign. It, it, it really is... It really does show you, I think, the power of human transformation. America and, and, uh, loves the comeback, Samuel. Yeah, I know, I know, and it's and it is it is one of the it is one of the better is one of the better comeback stories. And I think also just again, we keep going back to this, but I think it just fundamentally breaks this assumption that the people that we see today that we admire were always the way that they were. Yeah, but I think there's more learnings here, right? I mean, we've touched on these recurring themes. One is that he had to have failed in a significant way for him to reboot in a significant way right no, if he had just had some success you know his wife and him would have said look i've got some success let's build on it right let's not reboot everything such a great point michael you know it's funny i didn't even think about that but like you made this comment earlier on in this episode about just enough success yeah that's so a big like, danger so like like what would have happened had he won you know he would have he, had plotted had he along won? right he, had he won, he may have just you know continued to run over and over again every two years, protecting his seat. He probably wouldn't have been the logical candidate. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Maybe he would have, but he may never run a, run for Senate so quickly after. He may have still been the senator from Illinois today. I think that's I think that's I think that's right. Or or or, or a congressman from Illinois. Yeah. I, you know, it's 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 amazing to think about. What an amazing connecting of the dots there. I think you know one of the great things about your book is that. We don't celebrate failure enough for what opportunities it gives us. Yeah. When you fail, you have an opportunity to step back. And today it's very hard to step back because there's so many people depending on you. Mm. I mean, think of your, in your situation, right? You came to the United States and you were fortunate that your parents worked hard, they were smart, and they built a good middle class life for you, right? They did. But you know, you have friends today who are the first in their family to be in the United States. And their parents and families are dependent on their success. If they fail, they can't just reboot, right? They can't say, I'm yeah. going to take six months off. Right. And it, many times we have this opportunity to reset, like Barack Obama did. And you know, great credit to the man that he actually was willing to listen to an advisor who said, you need to learn how to speak in a certain way. Let's go through this. Because many people today, they don't want to admit they have a failure. Right. They don't want to admit that they're not good at something. And if you can't admit you're good at something, when do you learn to be good at it? You just go through life pretending to be someone you're not, right? I think that's I think that's such a good point. I mean, you know, it's it's you look at like the Dunning the Dunning Kruger effect, you know. And, yeah, and, yeah. And it, you're right. I mean, which basically tells us that oftentimes, you know, the less we know, the higher the confidence we actually have, right? Yes. And so if you, if you if you if you think about it from that perspective, then it can be scary to learn, right? It can be scary to actually go deeper into a subject. It can be scary yes, to, actually, to, actually, to actually start learning something that you don't know because it may actually weaken your confidence. And, and I think that oftentimes that's where people get stuck because they want to feel confident inside a room, right? They don't want, they don't want in any way to feel like, um, like they don't have that, that level of conviction. So they stop, they stop learning. Mm -hmm. and, and you look at a story like, you know, with Barack Obama, and I think with, I think with most backable people, it's this willingness to drop the script, yes, uh, right, and to feel embarrassed, yeah. to feel like you actually are like you don't know what you know, you're you're willing to admit that you that you that you you know what you don't know, right? And then there's a lot out there that you don't know that I think ends up um, I think becoming sort of the empowering thing. I think Charlie Munger had a great quote on that, which is like, knowing what you don't know is way more important than being brilliant. Yeah, and if you read your work and your book and so on, it's pulling a lot of insights from the venture capital world. I mean, there's other sectors as well. But there's, the book also talks about what makes America great, right? Great competition forces you to rise to the challenge. If that congressman had not beaten Barack Obama, there wouldn't be no Barack Obama. Right. 
You know, and oftentimes we don't want competition. We try to sideline competition. We complain about it. But it what makes us better. Yeah. You can't be your best self unless someone is forcing you to be your best self. That's the flip side of it. I think it's, 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 it's so true. You lived in Silicon Valley, right? I did, yeah. I spent most of, most of 10 years out there. You know, Silicon Valley is the only place in the world ever. I mean, I've been to many countries in the world when I was a partner flying you know, all over Dubai and so on. It's the only city in the world I've ever seen when people finish working, you know, the software engineers? And they get into, I think it's called BART, the, the train that travels. Yeah. Yep. I've never seen this before, but people open their laptops and start working on the train on the way home. <laughs> but, you know, when you get there, you're overwhelmed by the competition. It's scary, right? But once you learn how to respond to it, it makes you better. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think, that's, I think that's, that, 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 that's right. I mean, I, I think, you know, Silicon Valley can be certainly an intimidating place. Yes. You know, and I think that... Um, you know, one of the mantras that I think I started to adopt while I was there is that life is a life is not really a to do list. Yes. It's a to learn list. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that. And I think that, it, you know, that really has helped me sort of be in these hyper competitive situations yeah. because ultimately that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get better at my craft. I'm trying to, you know, in in this case, I spend most of my time writing now. I want to become a better writer. I believe every day I need to be sort of moving that needle just a little yeah. bit, right? But in order to do that, I need to be around people who are probably better at that than me. And That's your competition, to, right? Yeah, in some ways it's my competition, but it, my competition is also my teachers. Exactly. Right? And so I, I, feel, I feel like that, I think, you know, that, that's the mindset that I think sort of really kind of uh, changed the way that I looked at a place like Silicon Valley. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one because on the one hand, it makes it very uncomfortable, right? I mean, knowing that somewhere right now there's a teenager that could build something could take you out of business. <laughs> but at the same time, there was a famous American economist, I forget his name, he won a Nobel Prize. And I remember McKinsey worked with him for the first McKinsey Global Institute piece on what drives American productivity. Mm. And they asked him, you know, what is the, the number one thing we have to do? And he said, there's nothing that motivates a general manager like fear. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and he was right. You know, we talk about how you have to have incentives. And he said, look, if you make it clear to the American general managers, the threat they face from the Germans and Japanese at that stage, you know, Germany and Japan was doing very well, they will respond. All you have to do is create a good governance system, good rule of law, put the resources in place. They will draw on it to move forward. And what I like about your book is because your book is anecdotes and stories and insights that talk to that theme. Yeah, you know, the, one of the things that, um, that we found, you know, Dan O'Connorman had a, you know, with loss version, another Nobel Prize winner, yeah. you know, showed us that, that, that the pain of the pain of making a bad decision, the pain we feel yes, of losing making a bad out, yeah. decision is twice as powerful as the pleasure that we get from making the right decision. And so when you're in a room trying to convince anyone to take risk, whether it be your boss or partner yes. or investor, you can't just point out the positives. You have to neutralize the, the negative as well. And one of the ways that we that, that, to think about that is is by not just getting excited about the possibilities, but also to show the inevitability of an mm -hmm. idea, right? Um, you know, not just why it's new or exciting, but why it, it is going it is going to happen. And 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 it requires you in some ways to you know, separate yourself a little bit from your idea, and to put on what I call your anthropologist hat where you're really sort of thinking about where is the world really headed? Mm. Like, and, and in this case, the example you gave, like what's happening with our competition? Where are they headed? And, you know, what happens if we don't act? Yeah, right? And, and, then, and then showing how your idea sort of fits in as a vehicle to getting to this inevitable point in a, in a faster way, in a better designed way, right? Because I, I, I think, it, again, it doesn't make the argument of my idea is going to change the world. It, it makes the argument instead that the world is already changing, and this is this idea is is how we get ahead of it. I like that. I like that because before you put together all of the mechanics of your analysis, there's a wave that's cresting through the world. We might as well ride it. 
That's right. Exactly. Sunil, thank you so much. I enjoyed that immensely. I think our audience is going to love this episode. No, Michael, this is fantastic. Well, let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. We'll be in touch. I love the book. Good luck. And let's connect again in a few months and see what happens. Perfect. Take care. Thanks Ciao. Again. Okay. Bye.